Hi, I am Fry. I am Haddington's chief language officer. It is September 12th, 2017. Uh, for today's webinar, we're going to be using DDE, Dexter Development Environment, version 2.0.15, which was released about a week ago. Okay, let me share my screen with you. And here we are in DDE. Uh, okay, um, the main topic of this webinar is going to be how to think like a computer. But first I wanna do a couple of other things. Uh, you may recall that in the past I've started the webinars with telling you about the help system, how to find help, and that's this little button right here, and you can learn all about the help system and learn everything that I know about DDE, or almost. <laughs> okay, um, I've added a new feature to the help system, so that's what I want to show you today. Now, this new feature is not complete. The complete amount of this feature is not implemented in the current version of DDE, but will be in the next one, and I hope to release that in a couple of days. I'm going to type in the word color into the text editor and select it. Okay, now I want to find out what DDE knows about color. In click help down here in the output pane, you see, sorry, DDE doesn't know what color is. Hmm. Mm, that's not a very smart development environment, but let's try find. Okay, when I say find, uh, it says 105 matches of color now highlighted in yellow in the dark pane, and you can go through and, you know, find, you know, some, you know, there we go, you know, colors in a lot of places. Okay, but there's a little more output now uh, after you do find. In addition to searching over the documentation, it also searches over the test suites. These are DDE's test suite that you, we use to see that everything's running as we hoped it would. So color is in eight test suites. We can click on view found test suites and we get the list of them. Here they are, all eight of them. Uh, let's see, let's say we're interested in uh, inheriting methods. What's that got to do with color? Oh, I don't know. Okay, well, here we can see a test suite and it's using uh, color as an attribute for creating an object. Okay, now suppose we say, yeah, but what's weight? That's what I'm really interested in. Whoops, uh, first I have to deselect color up there and now I'm gonna select weight. And now I'm gonna do a find on that. Okay, I do a find on that. We've got 17 matches in the dock and we've got a bunch of items in the test suite too. Okay, well that's reasonable because we started from the test suite. Let's take a look at where weight is in, uh, here we go. There's weight in a job. Uh, we've got, let's see. <laughs> Uh, a lot of doc here. Here we go. Here's a weight in an example. Okay. And from this example, I might search, say, something else. Say job. I can select that, click on that, do a new search, and we can see jobs mentioned everywhere in the reference manual and not in any test suites. Hmm, I guess I got to add some more test suites. Anyway, what I've shown you here is that by doing queries, we can get back information and then use that information for further queries. And by going back and forth between the test suite and the uh, documentation, we can find out a lot of things about DDE, including kind of what it knows about itself. All right. Um, I want to show... Uh, before diving into the main topic, I want to show another article. Now, this main topic, How to Think Like a Computer, is an article, and you can read that uh, after the webinar if you like, but that's going to be bulk of what I'm talking about. But to set us up for that, I want to go over this other document that's uh, 
oh, it's so a month or two old, called Browser versus DDE. Okay. So this is this is to set up your mind for how to think about DDE in a larger sense. Now, if you're a user of a computer and you're using a web browser, your mindset is you're going to go to web pages and read those web pages. You're not going to be editing the web pages. Even if you know HTML, you don't know where that HTML is and probably it's behind some password because the author doesn't want you mucking with his content, etc. So you're a end user that's, that can read only. And that's okay, but it doesn't make it so easy for you to learn how to modify web pages, let alone, you know, write your own or something like that. So uh, there's a different mindset, and that is to be an author. But uh, we want to decrease the cliff that usually people have to go through from becoming just a reader to a writer. Usually it's download a whole new development environment and then learn some programming language and the help system is lousy and that and you know it's a big it's a big cliff. Well there's another analogy that I want to bring into play here which is Microsoft Word. So Let's say you want to print a document, and it's a Word document. Well, what you might do is launch the Word application, bring up Word in the editor, choose the print button. There'll be a few more options like, you know, which pages you want to print or maybe the size or some other formatting details. And then you press print and you get your document. Okay, so in that scenario, you're customizing the print fairly little. You may be choosing, say, whether you want uh, double-sided pages or two pages on one piece of paper or, you know, you know, a few other details, but you can't really edit the content. Now, let's imagine you, uh, you got a, a Microsoft Word document from a friend and it's important to present to your boss in a meeting you're going to have 15 minutes from now. You print out the document, right? And you look at it and you say, ah, oh, shoot, you know, the guy misspelled a couple words here. And, and I think I want to change the title uh, a little bit to reflect what uh, the boss is really interested in. Well, if you're just using the print customization software, you can't do it. But you're not just using the print customization software, you're using Microsoft Word. So how do you edit it? You just click where you want to edit and start typing. It's really easy. And here, the transition between just a user, just a reader, and a content creator is really easy. So that's what we're trying to do with Dexter Development Environment. You can use the environment to just run other people's software, say you might download it from the web or wherever, you know, get a, get a JavaScript file from a friend and just run it. But, um, if there's a problem, you'd like to be able to customize it and it's not so hard, you just edit the doc. So that's the mindset I want you to be in when you are using DDE, is uh, you are a maker, it's not so hard to go from a reader to a writer, and uh, you can start small and do lots of other stuff. Now. What we're talking about is an environment where we do, like Microsoft Word, print stuff. I mean, Word makes something. It makes a printed document. We want to make three-dimensional stuff, and we want to use lots of different processes to do it. So that means the opportunities for variation are much greater than they are in a piece of printed paper. Um, but it's also much more complicated. You don't need to use all the complexity of DDE in order to do some modification. And that's the, that's the path I want you to get on. Think of yourself as customizing examples and gradually turning them into your own creation. Okay. Um, there are a bunch of similarities between a browser and DDE. 
like it's using web technologies. It's using HTML, all these widgets or HTML and, and uh, variants of them. Um, it's using JavaScript, which is a web technology. We're using cascading style sheets. You know, it's basically a packaged, complicated web page, is DDE. <laughs> uh, nonetheless, it's a web page that you can edit stuff, uh, including code, and run that code in the very same environment. You can even edit the code of DDE itself, which I do sometimes um, when I'm using DDE, and then, I, and then I can see the effects of that immediately. Now, it may be the case that you completely screw up DDE. Oh, then what do you do? Well, mostly you just boot DDE and don't load the code that you were just working on. Or if that code happens to be um, in your init file, you know, that's kind of the worst case. When you boot it, it will automatically run your init file, but you can edit your init file in, in a regular old text editor notepad or you know something simple like that, save it out um, and then launch DDE again and uh, you should win. Okay, so much for uh, browser versus DDE. Now on to the main meal, how to think like a computer. All right, so I think of this as a kind of advanced course in JavaScript, but it's actually not so advanced. I mean, most, most JavaScript programmers probably don't really know what eval does other than, oh, it's evil, you should never use it. Uh, I think it's a very powerful tool. Uh, like all powerful tools, it can be misused, but if you understand it, you will be a better program. It will help you debug your code faster. It will help you design algorithms. It can, uh, you can use it for uh, writing little languages of your own design or new architectures of applications that you might not have previously thought about. So when I, when I say how to think like a computer, you might be thinking, well, that means sort of logic gates, you know, ones and zeros, transistors connected together and NAND gates and, and all this low level hardware. That stuff is good to know and I would recommend you use it. Uh, even if you're not a hardware hacker, there's some nice analogies from understanding low level stuff. But I'm talking in this talk about a level above that, more of source code level off of the ones and zeros and more into symbols and data structures. Okay, so eval is actually a pretty deep concept in many ways. I'm going to give you a few different definitions of it. One is it's just a function in JavaScript and you can call it and it takes a string and it returns something else. So actually you can pass it multiple things and so you could think of it as just a function that takes some data in and returns some data. Uh, it can also have side effects as well, uh, depending on, you know, what data you pass in. Okay, now if you're a C programmer, you think, eval, ooh, gee, well, we don't have that in C. And yeah, that's true. Um, in C, there's a compilation process. You compile a whole file. You need a, a main to run the file and usually some headers, and you have to include some standard libraries, and it gets kind of hairy there. Now, uh, the C compiler uh, compiles the code to run very fast, so C is great for speed, but not so great these days. JavaScript is running about half the speed of native C on a modern PC. So, and modern PCs are pretty darn fast. Uh, the way I like to think about it is C is about 18 months faster than JavaScript. So, you know, <laughs> JavaScript is too slow, you know, wait 18 months, go to the store and buy a modern PC, and then it'll run the same as your, Java, as your C code did 18 months ago. Okay. Another model, I, I kind of alluded to this before, is a data-centric model, is what's really happening with the Val is you're passing in some type of data, and it's returning some other data. It might be the same type or might be a different type. So we're, uh, we're, we're really thinking about just transforming 
some data structures into other data structures. All right, now, um, a more conceptual way to think of eval is as a translator. Imagine you're at the UN and you're listening to Russian and trying to translate it into English. So you are evaluating that uh, Russian language and spitting out another data structure, English. Okay, so um, we might think of a more language-centric or ling linguistic uh, notion of eval. Um, we can say that a language is a mapping between syntax and semantics, and so in one sense, eval is taking in some syntax and returning some semantics in the form of another data structure. It's often a higher level data structure in some sense, or at least more easily manipulated by a, a, a computer. Um, but in any case, it's still information. I mean, you're getting information out, you're, you may be turning it into other information, or maybe you want to call it knowledge because it's a little bit higher level. But uh, the notion is that we've got a language that's the input, we're outputting a language. It might be a very similar language. We might re be returning synonyms to what was passed in or summaries of what was passed in or a digestion of that. But the essence is that um, we're dealing in languages here when we're talking about eval. And eval is, a, is an important um, a way to implement languages. And I will show you that in a minute. Okay. Uh, the last definition I want to go into is more of a philosophical uh, notion, is that eval is a fundamental process in thinking. And uh, you might say that if you don't know how eval works, then you really don't understand what's going on inside of a computer, or maybe I should restrict that to uh, JavaScript and what processing it's doing because JavaScript is using eval all the time. It's mostly under the covers, but that's what's going on. And you could say, oh, gee, eval is really complicated. In fact, eval is the most complicated function in JavaScript. And so I say, oh, I don't want to learn the most complicated function. But I would say the easiest way to understand what's happening with JavaScript is to know what eval does. And so so uh, the bad news is that it's a tricky function, but the good news is not so hard to learn. And I'm going to tell you its core right now. Okay. Well, let's first look at a couple of examples of calling eval. Well, I've got more than a couple here. But eval, if it's passed a string, it considers that string to be source code, and it does something interesting with it. It converts it in some way into some other data structure. But if it's passed a non-string, generally, it just returns the thing that it was passed. So here we have an example of true, some source code. I click the eval button, <laughs> right? Uh, big surprise, I'm evaling a call to eval here. All right. <laughs> and uh, we can eval directly out of the, um, the documentation pane, just like we can eval from the editor pane and other places. But in any case, what re returned? True. Okay, so input was the output. Okay, so uh, here we'll do something a little more complicated. Two plus three, you can guess what that's going to show up with is five. Now, what really happened here was before the eval function, this eval function was called, the uh, like any JavaScript function, the arguments to it are first evaluated and then the result of that evaluate is passed in. So this eval didn't actually do anything. The, 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 call, the process of calling it, called the val on two plus three, created five, and then the, the value five was passed into eval as its first argument. And since it's not a string, it just returned it and returned five. So that's what happened there. Okay. We can get a little bit fancier here. Here's, here's um, evaluating a string. So we've got a string of true. What happens? Well, it evaluates to the symbol true. Okay, difference between a string of true and the actual formal data structure of true. 
That may be a little more obvious in number. Here we've got a string of three digits. Okay, one, two, three. When we eval that, it turns it into the number, the integer, 123. Okay, well, I've got a few more examples here, but I don't want to belabor this point. You know, the point is eval's taking some some uh, data in, it is evaluating as part of the call, and then it is evaluating it a second time with inside the particular call to a value that you're using, uh, and then that's the value that's returned. All right, uh, let's see what do I want to do next. Um, here's a here's an example that's a little more complicated. First of all, we've got a string right? And let's look at the inner, well, first we've got these three characters, right? Then they're surrounded by single quotes, okay? Then those are, are surrounded by double quotes. So we are evaluating, let's, let's just select this first eval here. So we're evaluating a string whose first character is single quote, right? And what is that eval to? That evals to the string one, two, three, okay? So now that we've evaluated that, we might want to take the result of that and pass it to a val again. So here I'm calling a val twice. Actually, really, there's three evals going. There's the first eval as part of the calling mechanism. Then there's the inner eval, um, evaling to a string. And then that outer eval is, is getting the, the result of that string and evaling it again. So we'll select that whole thing, click a val. And now we've gone from an inner string to this outer digit of one, two, three. Okay. So the real way to understand eval is to implement it. And I know this sounds painful, but uh, it is a complicated function. And I'm telling you, uh, a lot of experience says from many smart people, <laughs> smarter than me, that uh, the way to really understand it is to implement it. Now, it's hard to implement a full working version of a VAL, but we're going to go through the beginning stages of implementing a VAL so you get the fundamental idea of how can we write a program that can evaluate programs. And the way to do that is learn how to implement a VAL. Okay, now here's our simplest version of implementing a VAL. It's a function. It takes an, I'm calling it eval zero to mean it's not the real eval, but it's our, you know, special eval. All it's doing is returning its argument, right? So for all those cases where it's, say, getting a number or getting an array or uh, some other data structure just returns it, and that's what you do. So you click on eval, and uh, what does this do? Well, it returned undefined because the function returns undefined. But if we call it, you know, we call our eval, two plus three, what's gonna happen? Turns that, that two plus three into five, the five goes into a val and it returns it. Okay, so it worked. So we've already in this essentially one line of code implemented a working version of a val. Now, it's extremely incomplete, extremely simplistic, but I want you to understand this paradigm. When you're writing a big program, there's maybe three approaches. You could start from the bottom up and we could start, oh, what does a val do for numbers? Or what does it do for strings? What does it do when it gets a function call? You know, we could try implement all those pieces and then gradually build up a whole eval. Or we might start top down. We might say, okay, we know we're going to need to handle strings. So we're going to call a val and say, if uh, we need to handle this string, then call the string handling part of the val, da, da, da. We build our top level function like that. And when we call it, it errors because it says, well, you haven't yet implemented the string handling part or the number handling part. We say, yeah, we're going to get to that later, but it's erring and, you know, we can't really test to see if it works. That third approach that I want to uh, encourage you to uh, use when you can is to try to implement a whole solution end to end even if it's really, really, really simple in the middle. Then you're starting with some working code and then you can gradually extend that working code. So that's what we're gonna do. We started with just ultra simple, it works. Now we're gonna extend it. And we extend it, each time we extend it, we're adding this uh, brown text here. That's the new features, okay? So here's our second version of a val. What are we doing here? We're looking at the 
type of the argument. So we're setting this variable, let type equals type of arg, okay? And now we're gonna say if the type is equal to a string, then we're gonna do some stuff. Otherwise, we're just gonna return the arg, okay? So this is the fundamental architecture of a vowel. And this architecture is gonna proceed throughout the rest of this webinar. We, we find out the type, and then we just say, if the type is this, then we're gonna handle it that way. If type is something else, we'll handle it a different way. All right, so let's take a look at this. We're going to eval our new definition of a vowel. Okay, and now let's, let's uh, call it with this string of true. Okay, what happens? It returns true, not the string, but the actual symbol true. Okay, victory. All right, what did it do? Okay, well, first we get the type. It says if the type is a string, then we're going to look at what string it is. So if the arg is equal to the string true, then return true, that, you know, the symbolic true. If it's equal to false, return false. And if, if none of that happens, then we're going to drop through to this lower one and just return. So, okay, so we've got, a, we've got an eval that can handle three kinds of things. It can handle true, false, and everything else. <laughs> Okay, not very discerning, but you know, better than our previous version. All right, next level up. Let's evaluate this guy. And what are we doing this time? We are evaluating a string of digits and we want to turn that into a number. So when I click on that, we got our string of one, two, three and took in one, two, three. Okay, so the string itself was evals to a string in the environment and then that is passed into um, uh, uh, eval and, and that makes it a number. Okay, how does it make it? Well, first of all, we say, is it a string? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, is it true? No. Is it false? No. Okay, and then if it's anything else besides that, we assume it's a number, a big assumption, but you know, that's okay. We're cutting corners here. So we're calling this JavaScript function called parse float. It takes a string in and returns a number out, and that's that's how it works. So that's the code we're using. We're using JavaScript to implement a val here. We're not going to implement everything down to, you know, soldering wires and stuff. But the idea is to build on lower level pieces and understanding how they're combined so that you can be a better programmer. Okay. Next, we're going to take uh, a big jump up. Look at the, look at all this code here. All right. This is a lot of code. So what are we gonna do this? Uh, ah, we're gonna implement plus, okay. Now we're really talking. We're implementing something sophisticated here, arithmetic. All right, so let's uh, eval our guy, our new definition of eval zero. And now we're calling eval zero with the string of two plus three, not two plus three, the string of two plus three. So the string goes in and we click on val, what comes out? Five, good. Okay, how did it do that? Okay, first we say if the incoming type is a string. Yes, it's a string, that means it's source code, okay? Now, we say if it's true, turn true, true, false, return false, okay, fine. But let's say it's neither of those things. Well, let's split it, okay? One of my favorite functions in JavaScript is called split. It takes a string as its subject, it splits it, into different substrings based on where a character is. Here we're using the character space. So if it's got spaces into it, it's gonna split it into an array of multiple things. It's got no spaces into it, it's gonna make an array of, of length one. So here we go, our number has no spaces in it. So if, if the array is of length one, then we're gonna call parse float. Otherwise, Let's look at what else it might be. It's an array of length three. Aha, array of length three. Okay, see we're passing in two space plus space three. So we've got an array of three items. And then we take a look and see if the second item, right, this plus is equal to plus. And if so, then we're gonna add the two numbers. Well, how the heck are we gonna do that? First of all, we pull those numbers out, the strings of those in an array zero. So they have this first one, that's gonna be a string of two. We get this array of uh, the second element, that's gonna be a string of the digit three. 
And then we're going to call our own eval, eval zero, recursive call to that function, to eval that string of two into the number two. And do the same thing for three, the number three. And now we're going to kind of cheat here. We're going to call JavaScript's plus on two and three. And then we're going to return the result of that. Okay. So that's what's happening on uh, implementing plus. Uh, we're, we're cutting up this string into three parts. We've got an operator in the middle. We've got our arguments on either side. We pass them into eval recursively and we come out with five. All right. That was a little bit tricky, but now you can see how, gee, we could implement all, all the rest of arithmetic, you know, times and divide and stuff in the same, same kind of way. Okay, here's a whole explanation of that in case you, you know, want to review it later. All right, we're getting a little longer here. Um, now I want to implement assignment, creating of a variable. So let's evaluate our new definition here. And uh, what are we going to do? We're going to assign foo to two. Okay, it's global variable in this case. Use our new guy and okay, this particular uh, assignment returns the uh, the value rather than uh, undefined as uh, JavaScript commonly does, but uh, that's all right. We don't have to implement eval exactly as JavaScript is. All right, what does the code do? Well, if we've got an array of length three and if it's not plus, but it is equal sign, then great. We've got assignment. And what do we do with assignment? We're going to assign, we're going to grab the element in zero, that's the string foo, the name of our variable. And we're going to uh, reference that in the global object in JavaScript uh, window. We're going to make a global, we're going to set a global here. And, uh, and then we're going to call eval zero on our two on our argument there and that string is going to evaluate to the number two and then we're going to make the assignment with javascript equals okay so that's how that guy works okay now that we've got assignment well we want to be able to test that it works so we've got to have a way to do a reference to the variable right this is all stuff that eval has to do may seem trivial but somebody's got to do it and that's that's a val's job okay so our next version of a val zero says if that variable is undefined within our global namespace of window then let's consider it to be a number that we need to parse as a float okay real cheap a bad assumption normally but for our cheap implementation good enough to get us to the next level. So in that case, uh, if it's not defined, then we just parse it as a float. If it's not, it'll error. <laughs> Too bad. Okay, but um, if it is defined in the global, then we're going to look it up in our window object. Here's the arg, and uh, we'll, um, we'll return that. Okay, so let's see. I think I evaluated that and we'll call it just with foo here. And there we go. So we turned our string of foo into its value two. Okay, so we've got assignment, we've got referencing variables. Uh, what else have we got? True and false and number handling. And we've got plus. Okay, so, you know. We're, uh, we're a little more than halfway done, actually. Um, uh, let's get something uh, a little trickier here. Ah, okay. So we've been using this triple equal sign, this comparison, you know, is it the same? So let's implement that. And you can see where we're going. I'm trying to implement the features that we are actually using in eval zero, because the goal here is really to implement an eval that itself can implement eval. So we can have a we can call our own eval on our source code of eval and have it implement itself. Okay, how cool is that? All right, 
So in any case, um, here's our cheap implementation of triple equals, and it's similar to all our other infix operation. We pull out the middle value um, of our array as the operator of our array of three things, and we take our, our first and our last items and pass them back into eval to evaluate them to do our evaluation. Okay, so let's get a little longer here. So I'm gonna click there and hold down the shift key and click at the end. That's how you get uh, a long selection without dragging. It's not, it's in DDE, but it's in a lot of other applications. So if you don't know it, learn it. <laughs> All right, we'll eval our new version of eval. And that looked like it worked. Okay, and we'll call it. So we're gonna call it with is two equal to two. Gee, I don't know, uh, what's it gonna tell me? True, okay, good. Now, just in case we said, oh, everything is equal to everything else, let's have a contrary case is two equal to three. We eval that guy and yep, returns false. Okay, we're in good shape here. Okay, now um, we've been using return here. So let's implement return. Ooh, what would return look like? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's first select our code here and we'll now that guy and uh, our calls are going to look like this now so we're returning four right uh whoops i didn't select that whole thing Returning four. okay and so here we get four down here i hope yeah all right uh okay here we're going to return uh two plus three so this is where the recursive call into eval matters we still did the recursive call on four but four was something that wasn't handled by anything else, so it just returned it in the end. But here, we're actually gonna be using our plus uh, implementation from earlier, so we eval return two plus three and returns five. Now, this doesn't actually work in JavaScript's eval because return is supposed to be inside of the function definition, and here we're using outside of the function definition, but you know, uh, it's to get the basic idea here. And it could work, you know, there's no reason why they couldn't have implemented a val in JavaScript like this. Okay, so uh, we've done return, but now let's get really, return is actually a control operator, but let's get into the meat of control structures. If, okay, if, that's where you really start programming. If this, then do that, otherwise do something else, right? That sounds like an actual program when you've got if in it. Okay, let's select our source code here and click on that. We'll eval it. All right, now, what are we gonna do for, what's an example of this? Okay, if three equals three, then return 33. Okay. So, gee, is it going to do it? We're going to find out. Okay, yes, it returns three, 33. So what have we tested? We've tested if, we've tested triple equals, we've tested return, we've tested number handling. <laughs> we tested a lot of things in that one little example. Uh, and of course, we want to do, a, you know, a contrary example here. Um, you know, if three equals four return 33, and that's gonna return undefined, okay. So nope, it doesn't work. And now uh, we'll do one slightly fancier one, uh, three equals three return four plus five, okay. So we're recursively calling a val as usual and it returns nine. All right, now let's take a look at the implementation of this guy now that we does know what it does. Okay, not so bad, we've got what, six lines of code here. Okay, so what do we do? We say, well, first of all, it's gotta be a string. Um, and, it, and it can't be one of these true or false and it can't be returned, okay? So it's not any of those guys. If the arg starts with if, okay, um, then good. That means we've got an if, so we're gonna handle it, okay? What do we do? We gotta do a little parsing here. So we gotta find our uh, closing paren and we, uh, we find our condition that's the, the part between the open and close paren and our if call. So we're grabbing that with this substring to, to pull that out. So we've got our condition source code here. And then we go uh, to the end of the string 
and find our action source code. So this just gets, these are still bound to strings, condition and action. And then what do we do with those condition and action? Well, we want to eval the condition. And if the condition returns true, then we're going to uh, eval the action. Otherwise, we'll just return undefined. Okay, so that's our control structure. We've got if, wow. Okay, that's really starting to get into some hacking here, right? And look, you know, not too much code. Okay. Um, now, now we're getting towards the end and we're starting to get a little hairier here, but that's okay, we're doing hairier stuff. When you got lots of code, what do you wanna do? You wanna break it up into functions for modularity. So we like to have function definitions. So let's implement defining a function. Ooh, okay. What do we got here? Well, uh, we got another, uh, what is it? Six or seven lines of code that we're adding to the body of our original guy. Let's uh, select that and evaluate it. Okay, what's it gonna, what's it gonna do? Let's first of all know, understand what it actually does before we dive into the implementation. We're gonna call eval with a string of function, space, bar, open paren, close paren, curly brace, return, six plus seven. Okay, so this function, it's gonna return 13, right? That's what it does. All right, it's not exactly a complicated function, but that's okay, we wanna do simple stuff here. Um, so I'm gonna eval that guy, uh, and it returns undefined because, um, because defining a function doesn't call it, it just, well, it returns undefined when you're defining a named function. All right, now, but what did we do? We did a side effect. So before I evaluate that code, let me, let me show you the implementation of this function stuff. Okay, so we do, we, we detect that it's a string that starts with function. You know, it's not anything else above there, string that starts with function. Okay, now we gotta do our little parsing trick. So we gotta pull out the uh, open paren and using that we do substring um, on our original arg to get the name of the function, okay. And then we want to find uh, also um, the body of our function. So we do this trick of this index stuff. And uh, we get our, oh, this is curly brace here instead of open paren. So we can grab our body. Okay, now these are strings, name and body. Okay, now what are we going to do? We're going to bind the global variable of the name to the string of the body. So our definition of this function is just going to be a string and it's going to be interpreted as the body of the function. Okay, we're not, we're calling function with no arguments right now. We're not worried about arguments. That's another complexity. Okay, so did we define our guy? Yeah, I think we did. Now I'm going to call this guy. So we're going to call, we're just going to say, what is the value of this global variable bar, right? The name of our function. We're not calling it, we're just seeing the value. You hit a value, ah, oh, it returns the string, return six plus seven. Great, that is the body of our function. Okay, so we have defined our function. Well, that's good, but geez, we have to be able to call our function to have it be useful, so that's next up, okay? So let us grab our code here. Starting to get a little long here. I'm using my shift click trick here. Uh, eval, we're defining our new eval zero. All right, now here's our call. What's our call look like? A string of bar open paren close paren. Okay, what happens when we eval it? Returns 13, victory. Okay, this is a big moment, folks. We have defined a function and called it and it has returned a computed value. That is the core of programming right there. So, and we've got it in, what is it? I don't know, 40 lines of code or something. You know, not too much. All right. Uh, I, want to, um, I want to clean up a few loose ends just to show kind of how easy it is to do. Um, these are some simple things. Like, for example, if we pass in null, we want to return null. If we pass in undefined, we return undefined. If we pass in a string literal, it looks at the beginning of the string, 
and uh, there's a substring to cut off the, the quotes at the beginning and the end, and then just return the string. And does that for the two kinds of double quotes and single quotes, okay? So that's it. That's what this, uh, we just extended it with a few more lines to handle these few cases. Let's eval this guy. We've got function and click there. We eval our guy. And now we can eval and see, can it handle null? Well, yeah, we can handle null. See, we're returning null. And same thing for the rest of these guys, right? These literal strings that are double quoted, quoted inside and out, and they return a string, right? Here's this guy, hey, right? Starts off with a single quote, then double quote, then hey, then a double quote, then a single quote. Val that guy, and we get the inner string back. Okay, so that's it for our implementation of eval. We've got 40, maybe 45 lines of code here, and we have implemented the guts of eval. And I would argue the essential guts of pretty much any normal programming language, defining functions and calling them. Now, we haven't done a lot of other stuff. We haven't handled arguments to functions. Uh, I'll just give you a heads up on how to do that. I don't show it in this article, but uh, the way you do it is you create another data structure kind of like window is for holding our global variables, but that data structure holds just the local variables. And then during the function call, we evaluate those arguments and bind their names to the value that came back in this little, it can be just a literal object in, uh, in JavaScript named value pairs. And then when we have a local reference, we look it up in our local literal object and if it's there then we return the value so it can get hairy with default values and there's some here and there but you know it's doable um okay so we haven't done a whole lot of things in eval but we have covered the guts of it when you are writing a program Think about this is what's going on. You are calling a function or you've got a number or a string or something. You're passing it into a val and we want you to get into the mindset of running a val in your head. The easiest way to run a val in your head is to know how it's implemented. That's thinking like a computer. All right, now uh, in DDE. So what, what, how is this, all this stuff we're talking about in DDE? Well, we gotta, we gotta, editor buffer right and we, this is an editor buffer just a big string we can select stuff click the eval button and it evals it right so that's kind of like the same process we were going back and forth with and using the uh, examples in this tutorial um what's a file a file's just a big string and how do you load a file you just take the contents of the file and pass it to eval that's fundamentally it. I mean, there's a couple of other tricks and error handling, that sort of thing, but basically that's what's going on. When we're loading programs in DDE, we've got a bunch of files and we just call a vowel on the contents of those files. And now they're side, usually we care about the side effects because they're defining say classes or functions or maybe global variables, right? And then when the file is loaded, then all those variables are defined and then we can go off and call them. All right, now let's think about what is a job? Uh, it's, uh, well, let's actually get some source code on the screen here. So here's a, a simple job, okay? So what's a job? Well, a job is a description of a process for making things. Well, What's JavaScript source code? Well, it's a description of a process for doing lots of stuff. One of the things you might want to do with it is make stuff. Okay, so that's what a job, so, it, and, and so I just talked about modularizing um, source code by creating a function. Um, we can, uh, but we're creating a job, we're modulating, we're um, modularizing source code. What source code is that? Well, it's essentially the do list. So you can think of the do list of a job as the body of the function. So what's it got in here? Well, this particular one, I've got a call to robot.out. Gee, what does that do? Well, we can eval it if we like, 
And in fact, when we define the job, this will be evaled automatically before we run the job, just defining, and it's going to return this data structure. And it's going to return an A, a instruction.control.out. Okay, instruction.control is the name of a class. We're making an instance of that class. That class has variables black, undefined, and val, first instruction. Here's the first instruction. Uh, black is the default value. Why? Batteries running out. Let me do that. Get a little power here. Okay, so um, so and then we've got another item on our thing, a function. Okay, and when when a job, the job, the processor inside of job sees a function and it's about to execute, it says, "Oh, I know what to do with a function. I'm going to call it with no arguments." So that's what it does. So so then, what happens when we call start? Well, effectively, we call a special kind of a val that's defined inside job that goes through the, uh, the do list elements one at a time and evaluates them in this special way. Now, that special way isn't so special. I actually use eval and under, underneath to do that evaluation. Um, but it is a special kind of eval that's particularly good at handling these asynchronous um, instructions that we like to have for uh, jobs and uh, there's some reporting and, you know, captures uh, some interesting stuff and in user data and all that kind of stuff. But to the first approximation, you could think of a job as a function. A job is a function. And we call that function by calling the start method on that job. And that start method effectively evals the body, i.e. the do list of that job. And mostly we do that for side effects, although it can, uh, you know, well, actually, I guess always we do it for side effects. Um, uh, those side effects can be moving the robot, they can be setting global variables, they can be setting user data. Now, one thing that you might think of, oh yeah, but a job isn't really like a function because it can't take arguments. Well, actually it can in a fashion because we can initialize the user data to a job, say user data right here, and we can say, I don't know, color, um, you know, what does it look like? Color uh, blue, or something like that, right? So, so we can effectively pass in arguments by initializing the user data, and then instructions later on in the job can go into user data and say, oh, if the color is blue, then do that. Otherwise, do something else. Okay, so our job uh, actually is kind of like a function and now you know what functions look like because you know how to implement functions within eval. All right. Um, let's see what else we got in this. Uh, oh, okay. So let's talk about eval in a larger conceptual sense where, you know, we're, we're talking about eval as a translator between languages, but it's also a way to create data structures, a way to take an input data structure, a string, and make some other kind of data structure. But let's say we take some weirder stuff in as inputs. So let's say we have a CAD file, a CAD file for a 3D design of a new car or something, right? And we take that, and what would evaluating that look like? Well, it might create a three-dimensional object. Or in the case of, you know, a 3D printer, we want to eval our CAD file into an STL, very simple, simplified format, a format of a three-dimensional object made up of small triangles, okay? And then, well, let, what would it, would it look like if we eval that STL? Well, actually, you kind of do that in the, in, the pro, in the pipeline of 3D printing an object because that goes into a slicer, and a slicer uh, cuts the... 3D object into these layers that will be printed by traditional printer, right? And then each of these layers will have a tool path by which the tool head of the uh, 3D printer moves around to extrude the plastic, okay? So that's another kind of evaluation, you know, evaluate uh, an STL into a tool path. And then what is the tool path? How does that get evaluated? Well, that gets evaluated by the printer itself, the hardware of the printer takes that toolpath and turns it into another 
data structure, if you will, but that data structure is actually a physical object here. And that physical object um, is what you're printing. So we can sort of extend the concept of eval all the way into the hardware space where we're really tr translating data and or physical things into other data and or physical things. Okay, well that's getting a little carried away with the concept of eval, but it's a good way to kind of understand that proce what processes do, inputs and outputs. Now, um, I'm a language designer. I like language design. Um, it's, uh, it's sort of fun, but more important, it's useful. And so I might describe two ways to program. One way is to take a specification and implement all the details of the spec. And then, you know, you're done and you've implemented the spec, then it works and you're happy, right? So what happens when you're actually working on a specification in a company, right? You get handed the spec, you start working, right? And let's say it's going to take a month to implement, okay? First week, somebody comes in your office and says, hey, we've got to change the spec. Oh, shoot, you know, okay, what is it this time? You know, okay, yeah, you're right. And that's going to happen continually, right? And then you're like almost done with the project. Somebody says, oh, we got this great new idea. We have to put in this new feature. We've got this really important customer and it's going to make or break the company. You've got to change it. And you're sitting there, oh, I architected my program for this original spec, and it's just too hard to change it. I'm going to have to rewrite it from scratch. Okay, not a good situation. That happens every day. All right, what's a different approach? A different approach is to, instead of attempting to implement the spec, you implement a language which can do the kinds of things in the semantic neighborhood of the spec and then when you're done implementing that language, then you use that language, just a few calls here and there to create the final output, okay? So what happens? So you architect this language, oh, language is really great, and start implementing our final thing in the language, and it's, you know, things are looking good, we're just about ready to deliver it. Oh, the spec change comes in, gotta change the spec, okay? What do they wanna do? Well, they wanna change this from green to red, or instead of an array, we wanna return a uh, different kind of data structure or something. Well, rather than re-architect your whole code, if you've done your language design carefully based around the semantics of what the project is about, then you just drop down to your own high-level language and recombine the pieces of that language, and then you win. It's a lot easier to implement a new spec. So. How do you think like a language designer? You'll learn eval, because that's the core of languages. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to leave you with one thought here, which is um, often programmers like to think of data and code. We've got our data, and that lives in a database, and it's, you know, numbers and arrays and stuff like that, right? And then we've got our code, and that's like completely separate. We keep them in different files, and you know, they're even in different repositories, maybe, or totally different mechanisms for accessing, you know, maybe different development tools for the database, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's one way to think. It's not the way I think, and it's not the way list programmers think. The way a list programmer think is everything's data. So What's source code? It's data. It's a string. What's a string? It's data. Okay, so code is data. Hmm, code is data? Yeah, code is just data. All right, well, but it's just a string. It's source code. That's not like really numbers and stuff. Well, no, but we call a val and we turn that string into numbers or arrays or functions or whatever it is, right? So a val turns one kind of data into another kind of data. And now you don't have to get all mystical about, you know, what is code? Code is just data. It's all now know the complicated nipper of data. That's called val. Now, one of the beauties of a val is it's extensible by not having to hack a val itself, but by defining a new function. So, uh, and we saw how to define new functions in our eval. So now you are empowered to understand your own code better. It should be easier to debug your code. 
And hopefully I've given you a new sense of architecture where you can design like you're a language designer and develop on a higher level, which ought to help you make more complex stuff. Okay, that's it for today's webinar.